catalog which mm. that was black, you know, yeah, years ago. I the box, that. called the box. Yeah. And it's substantial, you the know. Paper quality is really nice. Yeah, I think so. Okay. <clears throat> so what is the story? <laughs> are, are you gonna do the uh, questioning? I guess uh, yeah. Yeah, why not? Okay. All right. <laughs> now, you wanted me to put this on here? here? If that's it, well. Not on the so You on. can put it behind you, if you or wherever. Wherever's comfortable, I guess. Well, this is fine. I'm, no, I'll put it on here. <laughs> there, I how's that? I'm too concerned about those things. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so, we are here in Philadelphia. And it's the end of February 2008, and I'm sitting here with painter Neil Anderson, who's having his um, his third solo show at my gallery, the Bridget Mare Gallery, that is just coming to an end this month. And uh, Neil has put together a new show with uh, 48 by 48 large scale paintings and. 64 by 48 inch paintings, and then a large um, 84 by yeah, about 84 by 48 yeah. inch uh, painting, a large piece. Um, mm -hmm. The title of Neil's new ex exhibit is called Traveling the Plane. So, well, I, I actually kind of wanted to jump back in time a little bit and mm -hmm. talk about how you got started painting and maybe in general, how, in general and, and how, I guess, the turning point when you knew you were going to be a painter. Ah, <laughs> okay. When I was six years old, my mother left me out of the car in front of the Chicago Art Institute in Chicago <clears throat> and said, go in there and get an art lesson. And you got to go into this, ask the people where the place is and so on. I was you know, really young. There are two lions on either side, I remember, of the Chicago Art Institute. You go in the front door, and somebody directed me to this big hall, and the hall had maybe 200 people in it. And up in the front was a, a teacher, I guess, with an easel, and was making a drawing and telling everyone to copy that drawing. So <clears throat> that's when I started. When I was two years old, I, they would ask me to paint, uh, to draw a duck. And, uh, and I would draw a duck. And they said, my goodness, it looks like a duck. You must have talent. <laughs> so I remember seeing one of those ducks. It was sort of like a duck, you know. <laughs> anyway, after that, then lots of different events that I recall since then. Uh, which I think were instrumental in encouraging me. One, I have a very vivid memory uh, of my father sitting at a table in a fairly dimly lit room, which is the, was our dining room, I guess, at, at what was called then a telephone table. And it used to be a table that held a telephone. And, <laughs> and he was painting on a well, small white piece of paper with a very fine brush. He was painting a a blue illuminated letter, uh, like a, like a monk almost. It would be like an illuminated letter in a medieval manuscript, mm -hmm. and uh, that was a brilliant blue color with yellow dots inside the letter. Now I remember that very vividly. One because it was so perfectly made, and two because the blue was so intense. Now, I hadn't recalled that for a long time, but yeah. Yeah, that came back recently. Uh, those were big things, I think, after that, probably. Uh, it was what I was always going to do. There were slight diversions. In college, I majored in philosophy uh, as well as art. Where did you go to college? <clears throat> a small college in the middle of uh, Minnesota, middle of Minnesota called St. Olaf. And I went there because I got a scholarship. And, uh, for art? It, it, yes, for art, mm -hmm. right. It's a small liberal arts college. 
So you moved from Chicago to From Minnesota. Chicago to this country. I had the idea growing up in Chicago that I wanted to get out of the city and be in the country. Well, this is a cool school within the country, like most small colleges. And uh, so I continued, pursued several, uh, you know, directions at that time, you know, literature, philosophy, and painting. And then I went to graduate school at the University of Iowa, and of course that was focused primarily on painting and so on. And what years were you in graduate school? And what years? Yeah. Huh. <laughs> I can't remember. Okay. Uh, 55 to 58, okay. I believe. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and then I went to, uh, to get a job after that, and I went as far uh, east as I could get, and then ended up in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, because that's the job that was closest to New York, you know? Gotcha. <clears throat> so and, uh, and then uh, at that time, went to New York City and went to the Cedar Bar, because that's where all the abstract expressionists hung out, and sat down, and I sat next to Franz Klein. And uh, I, I recognized his face, but of course he, he had no idea who I was. And I remember him saying, don't teach. If you want to be an artist, he said, don't teach. <laughs> <laughs> when I was about to start my teaching career. This was after you had been hired. Yeah, it's after I'd teaching. been hired to be a teacher. Yeah. At Bucknell yeah. University. Well, anyway, it was necessary to make a living, you know. Um. Yeah. And, uh, uh, but, you know, that was, that was what was happening then, was abstract expressionism, and so I wanted to get as close to that as I could. And, uh, and Pollock was still alive or just died, I can't quite remember. Was, this was 50, he died in 56, this I think was in 56. Gotcha, okay. Anyway, or, uh, yeah, 56. Uh, I didn't start actually teaching until 58, but took an earlier trip to New York. And was there um, a shift in your work um, from graduate school to graduating and thinking about abstract expressionism? You said you wanted yeah. to be closer to that. You're mm -hmm. in New York City. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, what were you painting at that time? Well, I was trained to paint academically, basically. And uh, that, I felt, was a kind of straitjacket that I kept trying to get out of. Meaning, but when I, you say academically, for those who uh, don't know Meaning uh, working from re a model, uh, re representational painting, yeah. essentially, uh, European, in the European tradition. Uh, and I, yes, that's what I was trained to do, that's what I did, and, and then I tried to embellish that, you know, toward abstract expressions. And I was impressed with de Kooning's women series, and I tried to apply that to what I was doing, but, you know, relatively unsuccessfully, at least in the beginning, and uh, received no encouragement in graduate school to do that. Yeah. So I, most of the time, was going against the grain. The University of Iowa was a big center of reactionary thinking, uh, <laughs> and they wanted to return painting to what it had been before, the Expressionists took over, and uh, the teachers there and so on were, were from preceding, uh, gen the preceding generation. So it, it almost sounds like you had two things going on, the academic side of, uh -huh. of, of schooling and then your own interests in abstract yeah, expressionism. Right, and right. So I was always arguing with the, with the teachers, always arguing with them. They had a course called Theory. And then the guy was, who was teaching theory was presenting his view, basically. And then I would argue with him. And uh, <laughs> so I always, always uh, got attention for my argumentative, uh, or my philosophical approach. You see, I could argue that way because I'd been trained to do that in college, right? Yeah. Did, did uh, that experience um, make you think that you'd like to teach art at some point? Well, um, and, and be in that field? Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I, it's all, almost a foregone conclusion then. Uh, and when you say that, you mean um, the, the, you the, had limited options with um, being in uh, the field of painting. One could either yeah. teach and paint or 
Um, when I was a kid, my father said, well, if you want to do art, I'll take you to this place where they have this big building and in all, a long hallway and, I, and I, down this hallway on either side were artists who were working for mag various magazines and they all specialized in a different kind of uh, painting. One did cowboys and Indians, another one did romance and another one would do boats and sailing and so on. So each one was a specialist and if you wanted an illustration, you just went down that hall and picked the person who was appropriate. Now, he said, that's a future for you, uh, which I thought that was a little limiting. So uh, when I went to college after that, I, I, you know, I got involved with more, more of what was going on in the art world. Yeah, and that was not what was going on. But that was an alternative, you know, as far as making a living. Yeah. The other alternative was go and teach in college. Yeah, teaching. So, so yeah. they prepared us to teach in college. Gotcha. That was part of the graduate school curriculum. That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Which is very interesting because now they, they separate that. It's mm -hmm. one or the other, fine art, yeah. fine art degree. Right. Teaching's not usually a, a part of that. Exactly. It's, um, well then it was, the idea was it was incidental. Uh, the, 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 um, the preparation for teaching in college was, was advertised as not being about education, but being about art, and incidentally you would teach things. So it was not, you didn't have to take education courses and things like that, if that's what you're yes. suggesting, yeah. Uh, was your dad a painter? Well, he went to art school, and, and then of course he quit during the Depression. And when, when uh, I, I am describing that, letter that he was making, uh, that was an assignment really for uh, a course that he was taking. Uh, so he did study, um, but based, but informally only, and of course he thought there was no chance that he could make a living. Well, there was one chance, that was he could engrave or he could draw um, with calligraphic uh, lettering uh, uh, high school diplomas. Yeah. That was, uh, <laughs> that was so he ended up working for the uh, Commonwealth Edison Company, which is you know the power and light yes. company in Chicago, and then yes. got involved with computers well in the very <laughs> early stages. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think back to that time, and I um, the WPA was very common for a lot of people, uh, a lot of artists during yeah, the depression. Right. Right. They were getting involved with the government with various art projects and commissions, um, especially in the Philadelphia area. I'm yeah. familiar with that. Well, I've had teachers who had been in the WPA yeah. and talked about what that was like. And <laughs> it was good. It was a good program. I mean, it kept them alive. Yeah. All the abstract expressionists were, were in that program. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. they would not have been able to paint otherwise. Yeah. So, uh, you're in New York City, you just accepted a job uh, uh, yes. teaching at Bucknell University. Yes. You're in the thick of abstract expressionism. Right. And um, so, I guess, what, what was happening for you professionally at that time? Oh, uh, <laughs> we would go to New York then and bring our work to uh, uh, in, in, in a van or whatever, station wagon then, bring our work to various galleries and get them to look at it. And it was, that's what the art world was like, it was very informal. Yes. And so you bring your work to uh, Leo Castelli and then Ivan Karp was working for Leo Castelli. And, and this is in Soho? Was no, he, was this, was, uh, this is uptown um, in the 70s. Uh, he still has a gallery up there now. 70, uh, 70 six or seven, I can't remember, yeah. 77. And I remember taking the paintings out of the, the, the van or the station wagon, setting them against the, uh, outside the gallery, against the fence. Ivan comes out, looks at him, and says, oh, very promising, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> then he said, well, let's bring these inside, yeah. which was the first step yeah. towards acceptance. If they like them outside, yeah, then, then, you, then, yeah, then you can bring them inside. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then he asked a couple of dealers to come and look at them, and one of them being Jill Cornley, who uh, 
Well, they're all, they're, none of them are working now, except that uh, Ivan Karst has his own gallery you know, yeah. Yeah, downtown. Uh, that was, the art world then was very informal yeah. and very open and very small, actually. Yes. So at that point, I met somebody who, who ran a gallery called the World House Gallery, which I think was in the early 60s. Um, it was an interesting gallery. It was designed by uh, Kessler. Fred is Fred Ke Kessler is his last name. Yeah. He's a famous European uh, <clears throat> art figure. Frederick Kessler, I'm pretty sure. Anyway, uh, it, it was kind of a World House, World gallery. House gallery. It was quite a beautiful uh, space and very interesting. And, and she was organizing a show, and happens that she needed a a spot. Uh, she had a show called Yesterday, Today, and Tomorrow. And she said, let me see, you're in tomorrow or today. I, yeah. so, so she fit me into uh, what did you end her up slot. In today or tomorrow? No, I was in today. I, can't, I guess. I don't, even, I don't know what tomorrow was. It wasn't clear. Being uh, reflections on painting today at that point? Is that what the yes, idea yes. was? Okay. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And, uh, and I had been doing these sort of large acrylic paintings which were representational at the time, but very flat and, and it was, was very popular. When you say representational, what were you painting exactly? Uh, exactly. Well, I remember one of the things that I hung there was a painting of uh, Nehru's burial. Mm. When he had just died, uh, leader of India. Yes. And, and he had just died and he was being and immolated yeah. there, and there was the pyre. And yeah. It was in Life magazine, where, where I got a lot of material for yeah. my work, and I did a painting of that. Yeah. And, and someone, some corporate person, bought that. I remember. That's what I was doing then. Uh, <clears throat> I, I guess it was, lar it was influenced by um, Warhol, among other things. And, John's. Pulling from real life uh, images from advertising popular, and magazines. Popular imagery, yeah. Pop popular, well, it was called pop art, but it, did, it went beyond just, uh, uh, you know, narrow uh, fashion, but inclusive, inclusive, including all kinds of uh, culture, society. cultural imagery, yeah. 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 And, uh, Did you have an, an, any sort of interest in, in politics or? Um, yes. Because I, I think two, I think ahead two, mm -hmm. two of your prints that mm -hmm. are in um, in New York. In the Museum of Modern Art, yeah. In the MoMA collection, yeah. right, and right. the uh, the subject is a bit political, so. Just a bit. <laughs> so. One is the assassin the assassination of. Uh, Malcolm X, and the other was uh, right after Martin Luther King's assassin assassination. Yeah. Uh, there are two etchings that they own. I did a lot of paintings on those subjects, those two subjects, then, right around the time that Malcolm X was assassinated. Uh, I did, an, uh, did paintings of che, che Guevara, yeah. and uh, this was in another collection. Uh, was that a theme that you were developing in the work, working with um, uh, political figureheads or prominent yeah. people in society? Well, I would say current events. Current events. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the wor so the world turns, you know. <laughs> uh, and of course, it was emphasized those those people that I thought were most important, you know. And that's why I chose them as opposed to choose. I did do a painting of a uh, well well known at the time um, uh, what do you call evangelist from the south. They called Jimmy uh, Billy Joe Hargis. So I mean that was a kind of uh, facetious portrait, right? Yeah. And so is this still the uh, early 60s time This frame? is the early 60s, Yeah. going up to And I'm noticing too, it, it sounds like you're still uh, working out the uh, representational work from grad uh -huh. school and right, right. shifting into your own language. That's correct. Yeah. Uh, well, I think 
we all saw pop art as an avenue for which to uh, travel to that next place, right? And uh, yes, <clears throat> I did a lot of things then, both in Lewisburg and in New York. I lived in New York every fairly irregularly then and had a studio there and did a lot of things from the newspapers. And this was, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm trying to think whether, whether the Vietnam War had started. That, it hadn't, I don't think, no. Yeah. I think we were still finishing in Korea. Anyway, mm -hmm. so. So you were living in Lewisburg almost full time, but also mm -hmm. splitting your time in New York City. Yeah, sure. Uh, starting to exhibit there mm -hmm. in New York. And, right. Um, mm -hmm. Right. I guess what, from, I'm curious, what was the shifting point between the work we just talked about yeah. and jumping um, into more abstract works? Yeah. I'm trying to remember all the steps. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but the steps were fairly gradual. <laughs> Uh, the next big jump, I think, was doing the ground paintings, probably. 1970, I started by, and this, I think, was influenced by a lot of the conceptual work that was going on at the time. I did a, a piece that took a whole year to actually execute, photographing a section of natural terrain uh, the same time of day for one year in a fixed spot so that when you look at it now you see a year evolving, right? Snow, all the changes that take place. Plus I, I did it at a constant aperture opening so that we could capture the amount of light that would be available uh, outside yes. at that time. Yeah. And going towards summer, of course, you know, it's richly light, lit, and towards winter, it gets very dim, and so. And it's <laughs> cooler, hmm? and more winter, cool light. That's right. Yeah. Cool, very cool. <coughs> Excuse me. We're making a DVD of that piece, because uh, um, Bill Duckworth has written music to go with it. Yes. And we're, we haven't, it's not done yet, but we're in the process of of doing that. And what, what did you call that piece? It's called Year. Year. Yeah. So you year. did this for an entire year. <coughs> you went yeah. out to the same location and snapped yeah. a photo well, of the ground. Luckily the location was right outside the door. <laughs> so I built this platform and so that you could set the camera into so that you would always have it in exactly the same spot, you see, because you didn't want to leave the camera out there, yeah. right? And when you say right outside the door, maybe you should describe to people where that is. And well, right outside the door is in the woods, yeah. <laughs> right. In the woods of Lewisburg. Yeah, because yeah. I live, the house we live in is in the woods. Yeah. And uh, so when outside the door is, is natural, you know, it's natural terrain and so on. And that is the environment that we live in, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I suppose that's so, a good point. It wouldn't yeah. be appropriate maybe in the city, would it? <laughs> yeah, well... <clears throat> A different kind of thing then. Definitely. Yeah. Um, so the ground that you were photographing was um, beautiful. Um, In natural. itself, yeah, natural, right. Yeah, right. with leaves. Maybe. Yeah, well, the leaves would fall, a mushroom would grow, which was a big surprise, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and the snow would fall, you know, it would, it would take, take place over a year. Yeah. Which. You know, from that, uh, I started to develop a new series of paintings that were called ground paintings. They were taken, first of all, from a single frame of one of those paintings, one of those slides that were in the year. But then gradually I branched out and I started walking around in the woods holding the camera out, clicking, trying to get random arrangements in terms of composition. And uh, most impressed with the work all over notions, Pollock in particular, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of composition. I was looking for something that would make that kind of composition. And uh, So you would take some of the photographic images back into the studio? Yes, yes. And at this point, were you still working with acrylic uh, Yes, I was. Okay. Yes, I was. 
I uh, yeah brought those into the studio, would project them onto, uh, you know, with a projector, project them onto uh, the painting surface, and then kind of make a drawing, which would be the start to execute the work from that. And, and size-wise, what, what scale well, is that? Well, there were the two main pieces that's, that exist were six by six feet. Yeah. And the others were watercolor, and they were large, too. They're 48, usually 42 to 48 inches, mm -hmm. and six to seven feet in length. Yeah. And uh, long horizontals, almost like scrolls. And there, I think there was an Asian influence there, but that's probably pretty far in the background. Mm -hmm. uh, no, my main thing <clears throat> was an all-over kind of a carpet, really, that I would then translate into painting, you know, make into painted form. Uh, and I showed those those pieces in New York at the Fishbach Gallery mm -hmm. for oh, a number of years, close to 10 years, I guess, that I was with them doing those things, and <clears throat> uh, I remember them looking somewhat realistic, but yes. um, it seemed as though more abstraction was creeping into the work, and um, yes. concentrating more on form as they went on. I was looking for a subject matter that would, uh, that w where I could pursue my notions about abstraction, and that was about the all-over composition. and. This seemed to be the thing that suited that idea. In other words, the idea came before the subject matter. Uh, I didn't just move to the woods and then have to look at that and say, that would be great. I was consciously looking for something that would serve that purpose. Uh, and the ground seemed great. It was, as it, to me, it was like a, an, orient, an oriental rug. And it almost presented itself very yeah. naturally to you. That, there you it are. did present itself very naturally, you're right. Yes. You're right. So we did those for a number of years, and I got known as the person who did that work in New York. Uh, the ground painter. Ground pa the ground painter. <laughs> and mm -hmm. another interesting thing I noticed, you said the work, um, you started working in watercolor. Yes, yes. Which, was that common at that point for painters no, to be no. working large scale in watercolor? No. It was not common, although there were one or two people, notably uh, a painter named Joseph Raphael, mm -hmm. and he did large-scale watercolors. And you know, I was not the only one doing that, but it, but it was not it was not popular. And the reason it wasn't popular was because people have a kind of uh, prejudice about things on paper that they're less valuable than things on canvas. And so yeah. most people pursued pursued canvas. And was that kind of you going against the grain again to Yeah, do it would be it would be again it would be against yeah. the grain or yeah. individual it would be individualized, yeah. Right, right. Uh, and how about working in watercolor? I mean that it's so vastly different from acrylic. Oh it is, yeah. yeah. Um what did you enjoy about it? Well, why, what, why the, watercolor, I guess? Why watercolor? Well, yeah. the, the intensity of the color because of the white paper. And I developed a system of overlapping thin layers, which you could pursue easily, readily in, in watercolor. You could build up uh, shapes, and then through a series of washes, you could end up with very complex arrangements. Uh, all working with transparencies, yeah. yeah. But the best of that work uh, has a kind of a color intensity that is very hard to get in oil paint. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just different. It's just a different thing. Working with the pigments and the pigment and the, the luminosity of the white paper, yeah. and uh, and the way the paint lays on the paper. Is different from the way paint lays on canvas. You know, the, the, you think of the, you think of the painting on a canvas as like a skin on the surface, whereas with the watercolor, the paint goes into the paper, and so it's less of a skin. It's more absorbed, really, into the 
to the surface. So that fascinated me for a while. And, yeah. and uh, as I said, I showed those for years at this at Fish Box in, in New York. And uh, I suppose it would have been a good idea to go on continuing to make those because there was a market for them, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. and there was, uh, but then it was not uh, satisfying after a certain point. So then you uh, you shifted into um, well as I remember um, doing not the same works but moving into uh, linen and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, working with oil on linen mm -hmm. and continuing the same series but adding more elements to it. Yes, yes. What, there what was a finding very difficult transition from. Once I tried to make those paintings on, in, uh, in oil, on linen, as you say, uh, to get the same effect was, was very different. Uh, and so they came, it took me quite a while to adapt or to find a way to do that uh, in, in, a, in a oil painting. And it was maybe almost uh, uh, 10 years where I, before I felt I got really the, the results that I wanted. You know, yeah. <clears throat> but I was I was dead set on continuing to try to work on that problem. You know, and and the problem being trying to translate the medium of painting on linen, getting the same the same effects of okay. transparency and yeah and luminosity and so on. Uh, my painting my for a long time my oil paintings ended up looking fairly stiff and rigid. And uh, that was not what I... I think graphic, when you say that, like graphic outlines of mm -hmm. one shape or form mm -hmm. next to another. Um, is that what you mean by stiff? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, very hard, hard edges, uh, harder yeah. than it should have been. Uh, yeah, it was just a matter of, of adjusting uh, the idea to suit that surface of linen. <clears throat> which I did finally. Yeah. How did you decide on linen too, by the way? Because I've noticed over the years, oh. um, all of your work has continually been on linen. What well, paintings have been on linen? I, I did a few paintings for a while on cotton, but this may seem like a small issue, but the cotton, when you ground the cotton, it loses the tooth. Uh, of the cotton, wheat, woof, and warp. It doesn't happen with linen. It seems to keep its its uh, texture yeah. more. Yeah. And so the the surface of the linen can come through then. It's a little bit less of a skin and more of the texture of the material, the ground, comes through. Now you can avoid that by, you know, using various means, spatulas and whatnot to cover that up, but I was trying to keep that, that ground. <clears throat> also, linen, linen is more permanent. Uh, that's one of the reasons. More and, archival. And more archival, and it's also much tougher. Um, I'm talking to a painter recently who had a painting fall over in the studio, it was cotton, mm -hmm. and it punctured the painting, you know, made a hole in it. Yeah. Yeah. I've had that happen with linen. It never punctures it. It may dent it, and then you put water on the back and Tighten it, it tightens right up. Uh, it is much tougher than oh. cotton. Oh. Yeah, and that's why I guess the old masters used it. Uh, yeah. Or maybe it was just available. But And it, it became uh, a habit because you can use various textures of linen to get various kinds of surfaces mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. very to very fine to very rough you know yeah M much more variety than there is with with uh, cotton gotcha. mm -hmm. so I that was part of the reason it, uh, yeah it's just uh, the satisfaction of getting a surface that was more appealing mm -hmm. yeah um, and 
that, incidentally, that was also why I stopped using acrylic paint because because it is more of a plastic skin, and I wanted paint that had a different quality that would be partially parts of it would sink into the linen surface, and so I went to oil paint because when you thin that down, it dries differently. It's a different kind of binder and so on. It has yeah. a different effect. <coughs> the uh, <laughs> yes, it bothered me that the, uh, although I used, in some of the early ground paintings, I used acrylic paint and I used it uh, very thin and, and I look at some of those paintings, they're fairly old right now, <laughs> some of the colors are disappearing, mm -hmm. uh, actually disappearing in, to who knows where. You know? <laughs> they're, they're very soft transitions, but now the transitions are even softer uh -huh. and, and, and going away. Yeah. But that's because I insisted on thinning the the uh, acrylic down so to get the texture yeah. of the the ground coming through. And <laughs> probably not appropriate. <laughs> um, and just uh, having mm -hmm. this conversation about the ground. Um, yeah. Uh, figure ground has seemed to be a yeah. continual interest yes, of sure. yours. I, Absolutely. In the war, uh, even up to until today, with your new series of yes, work. Right. And, um, right. Would you say that that's been your main concern within painting and um, part of your signature style, so to speak, with mm -hmm. being a painter? Absolutely. Yeah, I think, yeah, Traveling the Plane, the title of the recent show, is about attention to the surface of the paint, what it's like, and that's the focus of my attention. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's the focus of all painters' attention, you know, to, they do work on the same surface, but for me, the paintings, is, the paintings are largely about what goes on on that surface, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> not so much uh, from things out in the world, all the, those things enter in. But it's really about uh, the, the uh, uh, what, what can you say, the, the construction of the architecture of that surface, you know, how it's built and how it looks, and then of course its color and its form and all that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and Again, I'm kind of wanting to go back mentally. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thinking about your series mm -hmm. of, of ground paintings in watercolor, then shifting to oil on linen. Mm -hmm. um, and then the work has continued to shift, um, I wouldn't say subject wise, although you tend to put a subject on each of your shows. But yeah. um, I guess maybe in visual interest, like I'm thinking. Um, when we started working together back in 2001, mm -hmm. you were uh, doing a series uh, called The Whiteness of the Well. Right. And, and then that progressed into a series of temple paintings based on mm -hmm. traveling through Japan. Right. right. So, I guess um, it is, I don't know what I'm really trying to ask. Is mm -hmm. life your subject, things that you're interested in in the given moment? Um, <coughs> yeah, then it was. I think maybe less so, but but but, but then, and I, I was fascinated. I reread Moby Dick at the time of doing the Whiteness of the Whale series, and I focused on that chapter, which is called Whiteness of the Whale. That's a chapter, in, and in it he talks about the various meanings of whiteness, and I thought, that's fascinating, you know. And I tried to make the paintings be about different kinds of feelings of white, you know, and I did it with texture and so on. Uh, black and white is what it ended up being primarily. Uh, Within this overall grounded structure in a yeah. large scale format. Yes, yes, a large, it was, they were large paintings. And, they had no subject matter. They were not d related in any direct way to Moby Dick, but to, to the idea of white, mm -hmm. uh, and and how that would evolve. The, the temple paintings. Uh, well, I was looking for a way, um, 
a way to connect a series of paintings I envisioned, and I connected them from uh, Buddhist temples in, in Japan, yeah. yeah. I narrowed it down to the temples we had recently visited. I don't know that it, I don't know that there's a direct connection other than two events that take place, you know, at the same time or near the same time. Yeah. When I'm, um, I remember you talking about being in Japan yeah. and being in the temples right. and being struck by the architecture and the starkness of color and mm -hmm. there being maybe um, a black or white Black, element white, with and red, orange, or red, yeah. yeah, or something brightly colored that yeah. really grabbed your attention mm -hmm. and then the Japanese Zen gardens that you were visiting yes. as well and right. some of the textures of stone and um, right. patterning of stone. And I remember you bringing that experience into the work. Yes, yes, and I would say again, into again, the again indirectly, since yeah. there were no, you know, direct representations, but the, the, uh, the subject well, I think I was very impressed with, uh, with that trip that we took, and it was very vivid for me. And so I'm sure there are, there are connections, but to me there are no direct connections. You know, it's, it's all indirect. But what's direct is what you mentioned, is the whole idea of figure and ground. That's what's real to me. That's all that's real because that's what's right there on the surface. And you try to find a way to pursue that idea, at least I try to find a way, to clear away everything else so that that can be the focus of your work. And, and I think between the second show with you and this show, is a kind of refinement of that idea. Uh, I started in the second show, and, the, and it is more fully realized in this show. Um, the idea being that you have a, well, you, in the, this show I, you, um, I uh, introduced a secondary element. I, I mean, in the, in the usual way, you have the rectangle, the square, the, whatever it is, the surface. But I wanted to introduce another element that would be in conflict with or next to just that rectangle. And so the circle targets and ovals uh, that I introduced, which were uh, curved forms that would fit into that uh, given rectangle. The idea was to have those there as a kind of foil against which to work so that they would Almost like a template. Yes, it's, it's a, it is a template. Two elements within each painting of a square with a circle or a rectangle with an oval. It is a template, you're right. And, and then, then in the pro allowing the process of painting to break it down as it would, or to use parts of it and, uh, and refuse other parts of it. And that way, end up with a resolution, which is, after all, what you're trying to do, you know resolve all the parts, meaning that you want all the parts of the painting to be absolutely correct where they are. Nothing is arbitrary, uh, nothing is, could be moved, nothing without, if you move one thing then everything else would have to, to change. See? So what you're really doing is setting up a circumstance in which uh, this, this event the painting can take place. And uh, I did it by, as I say, starting with the rectangle or the square, introducing the curved form. And then into the, onto that, really almost arbitrarily adding uh, material that I photographed over the years. Uh, well, piles of rubble, mainly branches, yeah. I guess, mainly branches. And <clears throat> I have all kinds of hundreds, thousands of slides of branches, and they're usually piled up on the ground or they're in the tree, you know, yeah. on trees. Yeah. 
but that linear, those linear elements I use to introduce to break up the form I just described. The more circular, yeah. rounded form, working yeah. with elements. Right. Kind right. Of, yeah. So then when you break it up with the linear elements, and then you concentrate on the spaces between the lines. That's the figure ground issue. Yeah. Yeah. So the, it's the ground that gets most attention, most development. And then, then the lines get pushed back in, in, and the ground, the uh, areas around them come forward. That's classic, you know, and uh, whether I think the connection there is as much with Mondrian as it is with anybody, you know. A lot of people still mention, and they did recently, uh, Bryce Martin. Although I don't really see that connection as much because Bryce is more of an abstract expressionist, and I think I'm much more um, reflective and uh, uh, improvisational in a different way. So I see the work going back to early abstraction, mm. li like Mondrian, yeah. <clears throat> even though it's not vertical and horizontal, as his were, but the issues of, of uh, balancing parts and li with linear elements and color. You yeah, know. that was my next question. Um, yeah. How you decide on color in a given oh. work or how that comes to you as you're starting a painting. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. That's more difficult. And that's, I would say, uh, almost spontaneous. Or I see something, and like the other day I saw an orange sign on a wet brown tree. I thought, how intense, you know, yeah. how great. So I store that away. Yeah. Orange, and, <laughs> orange and charcoal, basically. Or... Um, Something of that kind. You, you know, so you always find around, them. Yeah, looking around at your environment, storing things away that catch your attention, and then being in the moment, you said spontaneous within the painting. I think also, I, you know, you see things in the newspaper, I see printed things that I like. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the, the, the color is more gratuitous, but, but then once you start on a theme, you either it, you know, it evolves, and it may not be what you started with. It changes, and you do what's necessary. And the whole thing is an unfolding process that may take a long time, actually. You're continually making changes. The diff most difficult part, I think, is starting, getting it going. But once it's going, you know, then you say, well, if this is this, then that's that. And, yeah. and you make decisions that, uh, you know, that could radically, radically change the work, but you go with it, because you, you have the confidence that it's going to work out. <laughs> yeah. Can we take a break for a minute? Yeah. I think my, uh, thank you. You're you probably want to rest for a minute, too, from talking so much. My uh, client is downstairs, so I think. Oh.